It is a beautiful day to be alive, and I'm so glad we have this time together. I'm Sana Laborn, she, her. I am a professor, scholar, connector, and avid reader. I've always loved learning about what's happening in our social world and sharing that knowledge, especially over a good cup of coffee. And so here we are. Each week on Let's Grab Coffee, I catch up with experts from around the world who are investigating our most pressing social issues and common curiosities. If you've been tuned in this month, then you know, each Monday, I've been joined by Dominic Lawson, the creator and host of the award-winning Black is America podcast. We've been listening to a select episode from the show and getting a bit of a behind the scenes exclusives. And unfortunately, our month is coming to an end, but we have one more day together. And so I am so honored to have Dominic back with us for one more show to close out this month. A little bit more about Dominic in case this is your first Monday joining us. Before launching Black is America, Dominic was the creator and host of the Startup Life podcast, which provided listeners with the edge they need in building their businesses and climbing the corporate ladder. The Startup Life featured interviews with an array of entrepreneurs and business owners and was syndicated nationally and internationally. Currently, Dominic is the pro- the producer, editor, and host for Meadows Behavioral Healthcare. He hosts the long-running series Beyond Theory podcast that brings in-depth conversations with firsthand insights from the people on the front lines of mental health and addiction recovery. He is also the host of the award-winning podcast Recovery Replay, which journals personal stories of recovery. And this morning, Dominic is here with us one more time here on Let's Grab Coffee. Dominic, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, Monday morning here in the Memphis area. And so I'm so glad to spend it with you, Sana. Yes, this is such the best way to start a Monday, start a day, just start something exciting. I mean, <laughs> I am loving it. Of course, thinking of we're starting, but also finishing, right? Yeah. We're finishing our month long collaboration. Um, but I love the way that we are going to close out our time together. Absolutely. And that is with an episode about Tom Lee. Yeah. Tom, this episode uh, definitely when when I made it, and I, I think I said this last year when I when I when I was while I was creating it because when you're a creator, you, you you're in the weeds, you're in the process, and you're like, I don't know if this is any good. I'm just gonna finish the process <laughs> or whatever. But Tom Lee, there was a moment I was like, No, this is this is good. This is mm-hmm. next level here. And, and, you know, I, I know we played it last year at WYXR uh, and we knew that was what we wanted to lead off with. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and so I remember it playing on WYXR and JB, you know, the program director was saying like, man, people were calling like, man, what is this? Like, (laughs) what is this? What are you playing? This is so cool. So dope. Uh, And so they, they played it, loved it so much that they played it again that Saturday. And so, (laughs) It just goes to show that like great storytelling is alive and well, and it's not mm-hmm. going anywhere uh, anytime soon. So I'm I'm so glad that we're we're finishing the month with Tom Lee. Yeah, I am so happy too. And even as you were talking, I was literally getting chills because I love that people that you got that feedback right. That because sometimes we don't know if. Right. If this is any good, if people are going to like it, if it's resonating with folks and, you know, having, you know, someone tell you like, man, this is amazing is is so satisfying. Um, but I also love that you said, like, there was a moment when you were creating the episode where you knew, like, even if nobody else tells you this is great, right. you knew like, wow, there's something here. No, I, I I remember where I was sitting. I was in, in the office at home doing the sound design. And I was like, this is a hit. Like, this is a hit. Like, this is <laughs> this is good. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, it's important. Learn about Tom Lee, this, that, and the mm-hmm. other, right? But just from a sheer, pure, like, you know, storytelling sound design piece, like, no, this is good. This is good. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people. And the Tom Lee episode has played well, not just in Memphis, but like all over uh, the country. Um, I, so one of these things as podcasters, we listen, uh, we, we we go and look at the analytics mm-hmm. and we look at what is called a completion rate or playthrough rate. This is where 
uh, we we go through a, a podcast episode to see how much uh, of the episode a person is listening to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Tom Lee, so obviously, you know, you, you finish the episode 100%, this and the other. Tom mm-hmm. Lee has a 224% completion rate. Woo! <laughs> which means not only are people listening to it one time, they're listening to it again and maybe even a little bit for a third time. Mm-hmm. Right. So that tells me that like we've it, it definitely was, you know, resonating with a lot of people, not just here in Memphis, but um, uh, around the country. You know, that's the episode we got the Webby with. That's mm-hmm. the episode that we won, won multiple signal awards with. So that Tom Lee episode is uh, it, it might be the goat of Black is America as of right now, <laughs> because it, it a lot of people really resonate with that story. They really do. Yes. And don't worry, listeners, you are going to get to experience it maybe for the first time or for the first time again (laughs) um, a little bit later. But, you know, that importance of not just the stories we tell, but the way we tell the stories and, you know, the Tom Lee story, his life is is that right? Is that through you through Black is America? Right. You have the story of of what he's done and and who he is, but then the way that you're able to craft that story. And I think it's so important for helping us understand a piece of our history as Memphians in particular, because Tom Lee, I feel like it's just such a an ever present character or person in our history, even though for a lot of folks, we don't really know who he is or who he was. And this right. episode tells us something about ourselves. Um, and I just I, I love that realization of like, wow, this is who Tom Lee is. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and and here we are, Sana, in 2024, and we still have people saying, I did not know Tom Lee was a black man. Yes. Like I did not know because again, and we go into the episode, you know, there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so to be able to not only have that realization, but also now you have a different acceptance. You have a different mm-hmm. contextual uh, point with the story. Now it just engages you even more, especially if you're a person in color that mm-hmm. highlights that like, you know, even if, you don't have like a fancy title or yeah. you don't come from a societal elite uh, that you can make a difference. And, and and Tom Lee found himself doing that on that fateful day. Yeah. I mean, again, I just love how Black is America um, really illuminates the history that's hidden in plain sight. Right. It's right. like all exactly. around us. We're living in it. And it gives me a different sense of pride, again, as a Memphian. But I'm imagining for um, our black listeners it's giving them a different sense of pride as well. And so I just I love what you've been able to do um, with Black is America. And of course, with this Tom Lee episode in particular, because, of course, it's always Memphis, 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 Memphis. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, it, it's 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 Memphis, 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 big Memphis all the way through. Right. You know, from, you know from myself creating the episode to uh, Terry Stevens, who was, was the educator uh, and, and the historian for this mm-hmm. episode who works in uh, Memphis, uh, uh, Memphis Shelby County school district and stuff like that as a historian mm-hmm. uh, uh, point person and stuff like that. So it was really Memphis all the way through. I, I tell people all the time when I was in, when I was in New York, a Memphis kid took a Memphis story with Memphis people and came <laughs> home with a Memphis Webby. Come right? on. You know, <laughs> and, and, and so, but people really love this story. And uh, I, I remember you know, letting, you know, people who are uh, older than us listen to it and just, again, just brought tears to their eyes because, like, we, not only did we not know this much about Tom Lee, but just thank you for highlighting uh, this important Memphian in this way. And, and it's like, we've we've lived here all our lives and we've never known anybody to present Tom Lee in this manner. So, uh, so when you, again, you know, and I said this a few weeks ago, when you get stories and you get feedback like that, it, 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 it means a lot. It definitely mm-hmm. means a lot. Yeah. And again, I'm just so glad that you're able to get all of this great feedback, right? As folks, as we like to say, like, I'm so glad you're able to get your flowers now. um, Because again, the work that you're doing is is so important. And I know getting an award on a national or international stage is one type of maybe affirmation, but then to actually hear from people, you know, like from the listeners themselves um, is a different, it it just hits different. So- (laughs) 
And, and that's who ultimately who matters, right? Like the awards and stuff are great, but like when people from your hometown or, or maybe people not from your hometown, when they say, hey, thank you for creating this and stuff like that, that's probably the best critical acclaim uh, that I can get. And I know that feels like cliche or whatever, but it's true. Like it mm -hmm. really does feel uh, different and, and better when it comes from people saying like, hey, thank you for making this work. It, it, it makes a difference. It definitely mm -hmm. makes a difference. Absolutely. You know, one thing as I listen to these different episodes and seasons, y'all, seasons, we're in seasons of Black is America. Dominic is just sharing a few episodes with us, okay? Um, so you have to go to Black is America and get the full range of these stories. But one thing that it, that listening to, you know, these historical kind of biographies or highlights of folks um, does for me is it helps me to imagine our future differently, um, and I think that's what learning more about our history, whether it's a personal history, community history, national history, what that helps us do is imagine different possibilities for our future. And I'm wondering for you, um, are there different imaginations that you have for our future, uh, maybe based in or inspired by some of the different people and events that you've been able to highlight in Black is America? Well, I mean, there's probably the most recent one that when we do this next year, we'll probably highlight this episode. <laughs> but uh, the most recent episode, uh, Guyon Bluford, the American mm -hmm. astronaut. Uh, you know, I, I have a piece in there where I talk about my daughter wanting to be an astronaut and being part of that process and how it started from, you know, to, to, the Tuskegee Airmen and going through that process of discrimination and, and, and fighting the Axis powers and stuff like that all the way to Dr. Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman to go into space, and you know, also Gaia Bluford uh, as well. Uh, that That's what I hope for. You know, representation is important. And so if I can put that out in the, in the stratosphere uh, for the next, you know, little black girl, little black girl, you know, black boy, or even somebody else who are part of a marginalized community to understand that even though you, it's never been done before, that doesn't mean it's not, that it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be able to create work that does invoke that call to action, that change, if you will. And so if that's through Black as America or through something else, I'm here for it, but I'm going to do my part to make sure that I did that work. So when I answer to the ancestors on that faithful day, when I'm, mm -hmm. when I'm done on this earth, I could be like, I, I did the work. I did my absolute best to make sure that we moved our, our community forward. Mm, I love that. That's something I've been thinking a lot about as well is like, how can I do the best where I am and right. really focusing on this present moment and knowing that it is that attention to doing the best now that will contribute to a future Correct. that, you know, I may not even get to see. Correct. Correct. And I think that's that's the importance of doing this type of work to have that a bit of, you know, immortality to get to where five, six, seven generations down the line, like you can piece of, pick up Black as America like, oh, so there is proof of concept that this can happen. And so I just got to figure out my path on how to do that. And maybe and hopefully that path is not, you know, as, as hard as if it was for the people who was doing it at first and maybe. Uh, that can be a thing. So yeah, it's uh, it's 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 definitely important work in that regard for sure. And I think about that legacy piece. Oh yeah. Well, as I told you, even when you first kind of gave me uh, that little snippet right. of Black is America, I said this is this is legacy. This is award winning. You uh, said all those things. <laughs> I mean, it was just so obvious. I wasn't saying anything. I didn't have any special insight. It was just obvious from what you had created. It had no, there was no other potential outcome, but for this to be a legacy piece for you to win all the awards that you have um, and, you know, what's to come as well. Well, thank you for speaking life into me and into this work years and years ago and seeing the value in it from its early beginnings, even when sometimes I didn't see it in my in, in, in it myself. Uh, so I appreciate those words, obviously. Of course, of course. <laughs> well, folks, I think we got to listen to this Tom Lee episode. Did we build it up enough for y'all? Are y'all ready to jump into it? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a short break. This is Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. And when we come back, we'll be listening to Black is America, an episode highlighting Memphis's own Tom Lee. 
It's May 8th, 1925, on the Mississippi River near Memphis, Tennessee. There are two steamboats, the Choctaw and the Emmy Norman, that are out on the water being used for sightseeing. On board are the attendees and the families of an engineering convention being held in the Bluff City. The voyage to their destination, for the most part, was uneventful. However, the same could not be said for the journey back. Also on the river today is Tom Lee, an African-American river worker returning from a nearby town, dropping off his employer. Upon his return, he passes by the Emmy Norman, and it appears a bit odd. That is because it's listing on the starboard side. Basically, it's taking on water and tilting towards the right side of the boat. Lee continues to pass by, but remains vigilant and keeps watch over his shoulder. But moments later, the worst happens. The Emmy Norman, with its 72 passengers and crew, capsizes. There are men, women, and children in the water trying their best to stay afloat. Lee springs into action. He fires up the engine on his boat, turns it around, and heads towards the Emmy Norman. Adrenaline is running high for the 40-year-old river worker, and the fact that he cannot swim only increases the degree of difficulty. But it was C.S. Lewis that said, quote, Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. Tom Lee may not have everything he needs for a proper rescue, but nevertheless, he is heading towards the danger. Not for honor, not for glory, but quite simply because it's the right thing to do. We come from innovators, heroes, and royalty. We are our ancestors' greatest hope. We face many challenges, but we mold that adversity into our greatest strength we are the glue that holds a nation together and allows it to flourish. Welcome to Black is America. The podcast that highlights little known African-American figures and stories that make our history come to life. I'm your host, Dominic Lawson. Episode 8, Tom Lee, the everyday American hero. I am a native of Memphis, Tennessee. It's home to many great things. Great music, great food, and great people. It is also home to an event that encompasses all three of those things. Memphis in May is a month-long event celebrating not just Memphis, but also we get to learn more about a foreign country. In 2022, we learned more about the African nation, Ghana. Now, during this month-long celebration is the Bill Street Music Festival and the World Championship Barbecue Contest because down here in Memphis, we are the kings in barbecue. Don't at me. It's the truth. It's a fact. Moving right along. <laughs> Fun fact, the first world champion was a black woman named Bessie Louise Cathy when she put down her $12 for the entry fee and came home with the $500 first prize. Go ahead, auntie. Now, as a kid here in the Bluff City, I loved this time of year because the month of May meant school was almost out and Memphis and May always had an offshoot of activities for kids of some sort. But the thing I really loved was the Sunset Symphony. In particular, the singing of Mr. James Heiter singing Old Man River. Let me tell you, I thought this man was the voice of God when I heard him sing. Let me show you what I mean. Courtesy of WREG Memphis is James Heiter giving his very last performance of this amazing song.
in Memphis loved this rendition of Old Man River. So much so that they were almost always asked for an encore. My dad told me one time that Uncle James sang this song seven straight times. If you're not familiar, Old Man River is a show tune from the 1927 musical Showboat, with music by Jerome Kerr and lyrics by Oscar Hammerstein II. The song contrasts the struggles and hardships of the point of view of a black stevedore on a showboat, and is the most famous song from the show. Famous American bass baritone Paul Robeson's version of this iconic song was inducted to the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2006. But this song fittingly leads us to our story today, because almost all of these events for Memphis and May revolve around or at Tom Lee Park after Tom Lee. Full transparency though, while I was born and raised in Memphis, I did not know Tom Lee was a black man until about 10 years ago. I naturally assumed he was white. But I'm not the only one who didn't know much about Tom Lee. First time I heard about Tom Lee, of course, was going downtown to the park. So I was like, who is Tom Lee? And then, you know, mom and dad didn't know too much. Once again, here is Terry Stevens, educator and historian. And like this host, she is also a native of Memphis, Tennessee. But also like this host, she didn't know much about Tom Lee until she was older. But they said they got a park after him. And as a, I don't remember how old I was, but we were always going to Tom Lee Park, Tom Lee Park. So as I got older and I started wanting to know more, they had at one point they had the monument downtown. It said, which quoted, and it was sit put up by Crump. Of course, you know, if you know anything about Boss Crump and that time period, it was a highly segregated time period. It said he was a worthy Negro. A worthy what? You know, I'm not even tripping because later on in this story, you'll see that, you know, God don't like ugly. A worthy Negro. I tell you the truth. Anyway, let's go back to Terry. And he found out because I was talking to my grandmama, Ruby Lee. <laughs> she said, oh, he was a black man that saved all these people. Oh, that makes sense. So it was at that point as a as a child, just first time I heard about him was it going to the park. Had no idea until just looking at listening to and talking to my elders, my grandmama, you know, my mom and daddy didn't know much. A black man that saved a lot of people. I tell you, I would have loved to have learned more about this heroic Memphian. But how come I haven't? How come Terry didn't? And why did I think he was a white man? Well, kids, that is how white supremacy works. And to explain, we need to hop in the car for a bit of a Memphis geography lesson. We need to go down the street first. Because see, not far from Tom Lee Park on Riverside Drive is Fourth Bluff Park, a place I used to go quite often when my mom had to run errands in downtown Memphis. But as a kid, it was called Confederate Park with a statue of Jefferson Davis. You know, the successionist in chief. And by that, I mean he served as president of the Confederate States. He lived in Memphis for a time. I can tell you that the statue and its base has been since taken down. Thanks to Take Em Down 901. Appreciate y'all. And just north of us is Odell Horton Federal Courthouse. Its namesake comes from the African-American Marine Corps veteran and later judge who President Jimmy Carter nominated in 1980 to serve as the judge of the District Court of West Tennessee. He was confirmed by the Senate of the same year. But that is today. When Terry and I were growing up, however, it was called the Clifford Davis Federal Building, named after the judge and congressman who was a signatory on the Southern Manifesto a document that was in response to the Brown versus the Board of Education ruling that opposed the desegregation of schools. He also was a leader in the Ku Klux Klan. And that reminds me, because speaking of bed sheet wearing equestrians, let's hop back into the car and head east on Union Avenue. I need to take you to another park that is about a mile east of here. Hold on for a second. Looks like we're coming to a red light at the intersection of Union Avenue and Marshall Avenue. Hey, check it out. 
So if you look over to the left on 706 Union Avenue is the world famous Sun Studios. It is considered by many to be the birthplace of rock and roll. Some of your favorite pioneers of the genre, we're talking Johnny Cash, Elvis Presley, and Jerry Lee Lewis, all recorded there. But what you may not know is that the African-American songwriter Otis Blackwell was responsible for the hits such as Presley's All Shook Up and Lewis's Great Balls of Fire. Okay, check it out. So it all started at the Apollo Theater, right, in Harlem, where Otis entered this songwriting contest in 1952, right? And then, you know what? I'm sorry. The light just turned green. My bad. Looks like we have to say that story for another time. But, you know, we do have other business to attend to. And so as we go up another quarter mile, we pull up to Health Sciences Park. But before 2013, it was called Forest Park, after the slave trade, slave owning, money swindling Confederate general and Grand Wizard of Ku Klux Klan, Nathan Bedford Forrest. There is also a statue of him as well atop a horse looking all air quotes brave with his Confederate outfit on. Now, if it sounds like I'm throwing shade at Nathan Bedford Forrest, it's because I am. See, I have a long running beef with Nathan Bedford Forrest because so many people like to hold him up as a person of prestige and renown. And as we say in Memphis, man, please. For starters, let's talk about that war record everybody tries to tout, right? While he may have been somewhat of a decent war tactician for someone who didn't have any formal military training, a hero he was not. I am reminded of his actions at Fort Pillow. If you're not familiar, on April 12, 1864, Forrest and his men forced the surrender of about 600 Union soldiers. But instead of taking them as prisoners of war or POWs, 300 of them were massacred. Many of them were black soldiers. This account was confirmed by both Union and Confederate soldiers. That doesn't sound like hero energy to me. Then after the war, many in the white Memphis community were also not fans of Naughty Nate due to his shady business dealings. He would default on debts, and when he became the president of a railroad company, it went bankrupt. And lastly, many devotees of Naughty Nate will say, well, Dominic, he became an advocate of African Americans later in life. He was one of the South's first civil rights leaders. I can't believe they actually said that shit. Now, while that is a bit of a stretch, and to be honest, there is a bit of truth to it, and I do mean a bit. For one, he did give speeches during his period advocating for the economic improvement of black people and racial equality. When four black men were murdered by a lynch mob, Forrest condemned the action and wrote the governor of Tennessee, John C. Brown at the time, and quote, volunteered to help exterminate those men responsible for the continued violence against the blacks, end quote, offering, quote, to exterminate the white marauders who disgraced their race by this cowardly murder, end quote. And y'all, you're not even going to believe this one. Check this out. Nathan Bedford Forrest, and I am not making this up, even came to the cookout, y'all. He was trying hard to get the ally badge. I'll tell you why in a little bit. See, a few months before his death, Forrest went to a barbecue with black people on the 4th of July, where he gave a speech urging African Americans to, quote, work, be industrious, and live honestly and act truly, end quote, as well as declaring that, quote, when you are oppressed, I'll come to your relief. Many of these actions appear admirable on the surface, but they are suspect by this host. Why, you ask? Well, many of these actions advocating for black people happened throughout the 1870s until his death in 1877. But I don't think these actions were as gracious as people like to make it out to be. Let's go back in the timeline for a bit. The 15th Amendment was passed in 1869 and ratified in 1870, giving African Americans the right to vote. But President Grant and many in Congress knew that certain people, <clears throat> the South, were not going to do right. So the Enforcement Acts were passed in 1871 to protect registration, voting, office holding, and jury service of African Americans. But it also came with 5,000 indictments and 1,000 convictions of Klan members. 
Hmm. Who was it again that was voted the first Grand Wizard of the Klan between 1867 and 1869? I wonder. Which brings me to June 27, 1871, when Faulty Forrest was before a congressional hearing to testify on the Ku Klux Klan activities. I'm guessing he was trying to get some of the heat off of him because he denied any membership he had of the Klan. My guy straight up denied membership. George Cantor, a biographer of Confederate generals, wrote, quote, Forrest ducked and weaved denying all knowledge, but admitted he knew some of the people involved. He sidestepped some questions and pleaded failure of memory on others. Afterwards, he admitted to gentlemanly lies. He wanted nothing more to do with the Klan, but felt honor bound to protect former associates. So look, when I think of congressional hearings and convictions, I can see why Forrest was out here giving speeches, kissing babies, and in black churches singing Negro spirituals trying to probably avoid fed time if you ask this host. Which is why as far as this host is concerned, give me a second here to grab my little stamp. This application for allyship is hereby denied based on the grounds that not only were his efforts more performative than operational, but also that the negatives on this application, like the slave trading, actions at Fort Pillow, and others are extremely objectionable. So no, I do not hold Nathan Bedford Forrest in the same light as, say, John Brown, a known abolitionist who was about that action to do away with the atrocity of slavery and not profiting from it like Nathan Bedford Forrest. So that is why I did not know Tom Lee was a black man. When you grew up in Memphis like I did in the 80s and 90s and you only saw buildings and statues named and made after white men, you would only assume that anything down there would be white. Unfortunately, there is not much known personally about Tom Lee before his heroic actions. As I said at the top of the show, however, Lee was a river worker. He was not a skilled laborer, so for his employer, C.W. Hunter, he would often just do a variety of jobs. So on this spring day on May 8, 1925, his job was to take his employer down to Helena, Arkansas, about 70 miles southwest of Memphis. This is probably one of the most dangerous jobs Tom performs for his employer, due in large part to the fact that he cannot swim. And there is probably good reason for that. But for now, let's leave Tom to his work. Tom is not the only one who doesn't know how to swim. There are generations of black people who do not know how. And there is a good explanation for that. If you remember in our episode on Ledger Smith, we discussed the move to desegregate places of leisure. Swimming pools were a part of that movement. I am reminded of what happened on June 18th, 1964 when civil rights protesters entered a pool at the Monsoon Motor Lodge, where James Brock poured acid into the pool. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but once again, those images were seen around the world. And it would be because of events like these and segregated pools that generations of black people will never learn how to swim. A lot of black people, because of the limited access to pools, because of the segregation, didn't learn how to swim. Now, in certain areas of the country, especially if you're along a beach or the coast, it was uh, required that they learn how to swim. But like you said, a lot of people here in Memphis, even today, don't know how to swim. I was fortunate to have learned how to swim at a young age. My sisters would tell you they know how not to drown. Even um, in the 70s and 80s, it was very few black kids learning how to swim. I took swimming lessons at Gooch Park, at Gooch Pool in North Memphis in Hyde Park. You would think it would be a lot of kids that tried to learn how to swim, but there may have been about 15 or 20 of us. But when the pool was just open for free play, it was full. It wasn't so much of a necessity for us because pools were limited in the black community. But now we have so much easy access to pools. Say it's important for us to learn how to swim. Terry is right. It is very important for us to know how to swim. According to a study commissioned by the USA Swimming Foundation conducted by the researchers at the University of Memphis, 64 percent of black children do not know how to swim compared to 40 percent of white children. Also, 
black children are six times more likely to drown in a swimming pool than white children are, and it all traces back to segregated pools. But there is hope, and it comes in the form of a pair of Olympic champions of color. I won my platform to, to be kind of like a tiger or, or Serena and Venus or Jackie Robinson, where it's, it's okay to do this sport. It's okay. There were people before me, mind you, there were a ton of people before me, but I was blessed enough to be a part of a relay that the world saw. This is Cullen Jones, a former African-American competitive swimmer and four time Olympic medalist. He is the only African-American to hold a world record in the sport. And he is talking about the work he is doing to reverse the minority swimming gap in the United States. I've been working with an initiative called Make a Splash for 13 years after I got my gold, first gold medal in 2008. And um, that was the focus is to try to never have a parent go through what my mom went through of me almost drowning and then having to make that change because we see, um, especially in the black community, parents that have that issue with water or a, a negative experience around water tend to project that onto their children. And then there is another Olympic champion, but I need to take you to 2016 Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, because the women's 100 meter freestyle final is about to begin. Back here for the last final of the night as we set the lanes. So it's right there in lane two, second from the top, Simone Manuel. Simone Manuel is an African American swimmer that is about to compete for a medal. Simone is unique for an elite swimmer. It almost kind of mirrors the African-American experience in the United States. What I mean is, is that she doesn't always get off to the best start in her races, but she is a superior closer. Watch out, because history is about to be made. Hall of Fame swimmer and color commentator Rowdy Gaines gives some perspective on just how important Simone Manuel's win means to USA Swimming. And for so many reasons, certainly personal, this goal means so much, but it means so much more for our sport. I can't begin to tell you what this means for the sport of swimming in the United States. As we get back to Lee, he is heading towards Memphis. His trip to Helena goes without incident. However, on the way back, there's a bit of an issue. See, the motor on Tom's boat, the Zev, begins to malfunction. He would have to let his boat drift back to the dock and work on it. It's important that he does. It's one thing that Tom cannot swim, but it's another to be at the absolute mercy of the Mississippi River. Let's leave Tom to work on his motor. Now, miles up the river is the Emmy Norman steamboat. On this sunny Friday, the Norman was paired with the Choctaw and taken about 150 delegates and their families of an engineering convention to Pickney Landing, about 20 miles south of Memphis. Both vessels belong to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Norman was fairly new, being less than a year old. Before May 8th, there were some improved modifications done, which included going away from a coal burning system to an oil system to improve efficiency. However, May 8th would be the Norman's first voyage since those modifications. Now, the Norman is captained by Howard Fenton, a seasoned riverman with almost 40 years of experience. However, today marks the first time he has been the captain of the Norman. Another item of note, remember, there are about 150 people that went down to Pickney Landing on the Norman and on the Choctaw. The riders were virtually split in half between the two boats. So as the Norman and the Choctaw head back up the Mississippi River towards Memphis, it would be the Norman that starts to experience complications. The Choctaw and his passengers pulls further ahead, unaware of the Norman's troubles. And those complications were not only adding up, but the passengers were starting to experience them. 
The boat is unsteady, so much so that the water is starting to splash up on the deck and getting passengers' feet wet. The Norma is starting to list on the starboard side. Once again, if you're not familiar, it's leaning towards the right side. Captain Fenton is not overly concerned as he knew sometimes the current would cause this and it would self-correct. But on this day on May 8th, it is not self-correcting. So Captain Fenton asked the passengers to go to the other side of the boat in an effort to level the vessel. The move only works temporarily and the Norman begins to list even more. The passengers are now panicking because they are unable to keep their footing. Things are dire for the Emmy Norman. Captain Fenton knows it. While initially Captain Fenton was not overly concerned, someone else was troubled by what he was seeing. Tom Lee, after working on his motor of the Zev for about an hour, would head back out into the water, heading upstream, and eventually brings up the rear of the Norman. He is watching the difficulties the boat is having. He would later say, quote, it was riding serious, end quote. So while he does zip past the Norman, he turns off the motor of the Zev and decided to just keep watch over his shoulder just to be safe. This is something that is interesting about us as a people. There's a level of intuition that something is about to happen. Sometimes it's a good event, but often, given the African-American experience, it's a bad one. Maybe it's due to what we have gone through as a people. Some have said it's divinely inspired. But it was Oprah Winfrey who said, quote, follow your instincts. That's where true wisdom manifests itself. And it would be that wisdom that saved many lives on that spring day in 1925. A few of the passengers start to don life preservers. But Captain Fenton knew the fate of the Emmy Norman. The best he could hope for was to get the boat over to the shore to prevent a catastrophic event taking place. So he heels the wheel over desperately, trying to get to shore. But he was too late. The rudder fails, and the boat was caught crossways into the current. Suddenly, a powerful current hits the hull and completely lifts the port side out of the water. Within seconds, the Norman capsizes, and many of the passengers and crew are at the mercy of the mighty Mississippi River. Some are actually trapped in the main cabin of the boat. Everyone is trying their best to grab something to help them stay afloat. Tables, chairs, some managed to even get onto the boat's hull. Many tried to swim to shore, but unfortunately, they were not successful. As I said before, the Mississippi River is a powerful body of water. The currents are so strong and the water can get really cold. And remember, this is 1925, so think about the style of clothing. Heavy and damp clothing can really wear you down and force you to exert more energy as you try to save yourself or try to save other people. Captain Fenton himself is in the water trying to survive. He managed to leap through a pilot house window in an effort to not get trapped. The Norman would eventually sink to the bottom of the Mississippi. He manages to dog paddle over to a few life preservers, but the exertion gets to him. He is barely able to keep his head above water. Seconds before Captain Fenton is about to share the same fate as the Norman, somebody grabs him. Is Tom Lee. Lee has finally made it to the site where the Norman went down, and he is pulling survivors into the Zeb and taking them to shore. 
He puts Captain Fenton into the Zev and also takes him to shore. Then Lee goes back out into the water to rescue more survivors. One man tried to swim the shore, but the current kept pushing him away. Then the man manages to use his tie to tether himself to a willow. His quick thinking allowed for Lee to get other survivors who are not in such a stable condition, and Lee was able to pick him up in the Zev and take him to shore. Also, a 24-year-old Memphis socialite, Margaret Oates, was able to use her parasol to trap air underneath to stay afloat for Tom to come and rescue her later in the Zev. Tom makes four trips back and forth, and eventually he saves 32 people from the capsizing of the Emmy Norman. This is almost half of the passengers. And while Tom was courageous in bringing them to shore, his next action would help ensure their survival. If you had just survived being in the waters of the Mississippi, then hypothermia would be your next issue. And with being in shock and in very damp clothes and probably really cold, you're probably just thankful to be alive. So Lee would gather some driftwood and build a fire to keep the survivors as warm as possible until proper medical attention could arrive. And then what does Lee do after he finishes? He goes back into the river in an effort to find more survivors. By the afternoon, the city of Memphis is alerted to what happened. Many people, newspaper reporters, police, doctors, all greet the riders of the Choctaw, the other steamer paired with the Norman that day. The riders of the Choctaw are shocked, as this is the first time they are hearing of the events. Mayor Rollett Payne and others board the Choctaw and head back downstream to see the wreckage and bring back the survivors of the Norman. When they arrive, they pick up the survivors and they are told about the mysterious black man that saved him. However, Tom is nowhere to be found. That is because into the night, Tom is still out on the river looking for survivors. Eventually, they would catch up to Tom Lee to find this modest and humble man. Obviously, he is deemed a hero. One man said, quote, We all owe our lives to Tom Lee. There's all there is to it. When asked about his actions, Tom responded, quote, I guess I didn't do anything more than anyone else would have done in my place. The citizens of Memphis wholeheartedly disagreed. Longtime newspaper The Commercial Appeal said he should be awarded the Carnegie Medal of Heroism. The now defunct Memphis Press Scimitar said, quote, We do not know what the rule of government is about giving pensions to civilians, but if there is no rule against it, Tom should be made comfortable for life. And the citizens of Memphis would make sure that happened. You have to know that some of the people he saved were some of the elites in Memphis, or they were friends of the elites. A Memphis jeweler would present him with a gold watch. And Tom Lee is also afforded a trip to Washington, D.C. to meet President Calvin Coolidge. Now, eventually, as Tom is asked himself what he wanted, and Tom said, I need a house. So the people of Memphis got together and donated the money to buy him a house. At 923 North Mansfield Street here in Memphis, his house is still there, but it's in disrepair these days. And that riverman work he was doing? Nah, he was done with all that. He was given a job in the sanitation department, which was not as dangerous. And when he was granted early retirement, he received double the pension. Yeah, Memphis really took care of him. He was even sent a Christmas card and $50 every year until he succumbed to cancer on April 1st, 1952. He was 67 years old. After his death, Asta Park, which sits at the foot of the world-famous Bill Street and right next to the Mississippi River, was renamed as Tom Lee Park. 
This move was even endorsed by E.H. Crump, or Boss Crump, as we call him here in Memphis. He was mayor for a term, but he effectively picked the mayor of Memphis for almost half a century. Terry says that Tom Lee's actions must have been very commendable to get the endorsement of Boss Crump. To even have recognized a black man during that particular time, late 1800s, early 1900s, was something unheard of. But he recognized he recognized Tom Lee because of what he did. For a white man to do that at that time, he had a pool named after him over at Carnes Elementary. There was a pool that was named after him. And what's crazy is they said for somebody that couldn't swim to have a pool named after him was ironic. <laughs> to have someone like Bob Crump, Mayor Crump, to recognize a black man. And if you look at his background, that speaks volumes about Tom Lee in itself. And if the new Tom Lee Park, an obelisk I mentioned earlier, with the inscription, A Worthy Negro, would be erected there. But in 2003, due to the storm of Hurricane Elvis, it would be knocked over and <laughs> destroyed. Oops. See, I told you God don't like ugly. A new and beautiful monument has since been created that is far more honorable and befitting of a hero like Tom Lee. And to this day, it still sits on the park that bears his name. Also, interestingly, Tom Lee is also possibly responsible for another famous Memphis landmark. The Dixon Gallery and Gardens is a Memphis staple with art exhibitions and a beautiful place to have a wedding. The 17-acre campus is enjoyed by many that come from all over the region. It was donated by the Dixons, Hugh and Margaret. If that name sounds familiar, that is because Margaret Oates Dixon was the 24-year-old parasol floater who was saved by Tom Lee on that fateful day. Quite possibly, if Tom doesn't save her, we may not have this national treasure sitting in our backyard now. That's the beauty of history. It's almost impossible to be disconnected from it. The legacy of Tom Lee is part of a long legacy of black America that is filled with everyday people saving lives. Back in 2018, 300 miles east of Memphis in Nashville, James Shaw Jr. stopped a gunman in Waffle House and from killing more people. He ran up to the shooter and grabbed the barrel of his assault rifle and wrestled it away from him. How about August 7th, 1982 at Fenway Park in Boston? A foul ball hits a four-year-old Jonathan Keene in the forehead. Seconds later, Future Hall of Famer Jim Rice jumps up from the dugout, grabs Jonathan from the stands, and takes him into the clubhouse so that the team doctor could do what he could until he could be transferred over to Boston Children's Hospital. Jim then goes back to finish the game with Jonathan's blood on his uniform. In the post-game press conference, he said that he moved quickly because getting him to the team doctor was faster than waiting for medical help to arrive to the stadium. And when he was labeled a hero, Jim simply said, if that was your son, what would you do? And let us not forget the actions of Eugene Goodman on January 6, 2021, who steered insurrectionists on the different path so that members of Congress could get away safely. I hope this season of Black is America has shown you that history is not just a collection of stories from the past. They are reminders of the indomitable spirit we have as a people. They tell us the greatness and excellence it's not just something we inherited, but it's encoded in our DNA. And it is for that reason we have the story of Tom Lee, who did not ask permission to do the right thing. He simply did. The humble Memphian may not have been a person of the societal elite or have a fancy title, but he shows us that being a decent human being and the willingness to help people when they are in dire need transcends any bank account figure level of education, or any marginalization one may face. And that is why Tom Lee is an everyday American hero. The Black is America podcast, a presentation of Owl's Education, was created and is written, researched, and produced by me, Dominic Lawson. Executive producer, Kendall Lawson. Cover art was created by Alexandria Eddings of Art Life Connections. 